Joseph T. Pardee, uh, with the U.S. Geological Survey, he was the discoverer of Lake Missoula. He published the first paper of his professional career on Lake Missoula in 1910. His final professional publication in 1942 was his second and only other paper on the subject of Lake Missoula. So he was a young graduate student in 1910. First thing he discovered was the bottom of Lake Missoula had what appeared to be lake bottom sediments. Fair enough. Then he thought there was a lake, and he referred to some uh, work by geologist T.C. Chamberlain from the 1890s who had also theorized that there had been a lake in those valleys. He went the next step, though, and he found the high water marks. He found the strand lines. So he wrote this paper in 1910, Glacial Lake Missoula, and in there he documents his finding on the valley floor of what looks like lake sediments and his discovery of the strand lines. Well, he continued to study it, but he didn't write another paper for 32 years. Why? Because his superior at the Geological Survey strongly discouraged him from doing that. So finally, when he retired from the survey, he wrote his second paper. This one was entitled, Unusual Currents in Glacial Lake Missoula. So he discovered something new that he didn't know when he wrote his 1910 paper. And that led him to this, the title of this 1942 paper, Unusual Currents. And yes, that's an understatement, that they're unusual. And I'm going to show you what he found. So there was this famous story that I won't, I'll, I'll save the, the details of it for another place. But there was a point where the geological community sent signals to Bretts that they were ready to give his flood theory a, a fair hearing. So they invited him to Washington to give a talk to this select group of elite geologists. And um, it was organized by this um, younger geologist, though, who felt like he really, he was going to make sort of a career out of discrediting Bretts and showing that, you know, Bretts's theory of gigantic floods made no sense and all the evidence that he was citing was actually formed over long periods of time incrementally rather than by gigantic floods. James Galuli was his name. He was the one who sort of organized this event in Washington, D.C. They invited Brett. They gave the impression to, that they were going to give a, a fair hearing, but in reality, the purpose of it was to pretty much discredit it and put it to bed and get rid of it. We don't need these giant floods. We got rid of the giant floods with Noah's flood in the Bible, right? Our our science is now not being dictated by uh, r religious priorities anymore, right? So that was sort of the idea. Well, they get there. Brett's, you know, gives his presentation. Probably nobody is fully convinced. Probably most of them are not convinced. Some of them may have questions, but... In the group there was J.T. Pardee. He was there listening. At this point, Bretz did not really know about the existence of this giant lake. J.T. Pardee leans over to his colleague sitting next to him and whispers, I know where Bretz's flood came from. That was a turning point, right? That was a turning point. Um, I mean, it, it, it still took another 10 or 20 years, and younger geologists coming up to the profession that were more open-minded, and it took really up until 1969. I think there was a major paper published with Bretz as a lead author, but a bunch of other geologists, and it was like the confirmation, the final mm -hmm. confirmation that, yes, a majority of us realize now that Bretz's floods are real. The controversies, such as they were, would have been on the specifics of the flood, how many, the origins, and all of this. The next step in these flood studies came with Victor Baker, who published a paper in 1973. He had, he had the background in hydrology, and he knew all the equations. He knew how to solve um, discharge. The Q, letter Q stands for peak discharge. Well, Q, if it's a capital Q, it's peak discharge. So he knew how to use the basic formulas, the engineering formulas and the hydraulic formulas to calculate peak discharges. So he went into that Spokane Valley just north between Lake Pend Oreille 
and Spokane in a place called Rath Drum Prairie. And he found the high water marks, so he had the width of the valley. He knew the gradient, you know, because it was sloping away from Lake Ponderay down towards Spokane. Those are the basic two. You need the channel geometry, you need the gradient, and you need the uh, you need the, the, the maximum water level. And then you introduce a coefficient into your equation that uh, for the amount of turbulence. The smoother the channel, the less the turbulence, the, the greater the, the rougher the channel, the greater the turbulence. Introducing turbulence into the flow causes a more rapid dissipation of energy. So anyways, he used the, the hydro, hydraulic formulas, and that's when he came up with that it was an unbelievable amount of water that had flowed through there, between seven and 800 million cubic feet per second. So that's, you know, like 20 times the combined flow of every single river on Earth from every continent. So that was in 73. Well, then in 19, around 1980, Richard Waite happens to visit this place in Pasco Basin where you see the rhythmites, and I'll show you. These are the back flood layers. And what Waite assumed, looking at that, was that each of those, and there were 39 exposed layers in this ditch. I've been there four times now. Last time when we were on our trip, Bradley was able to procure a private entrance into the property owners and took us down there because it's, you know, you're, it's no trespassing. You can't just casually go in there and look at it. So Brad Young procured us right to go in there. The owners came down, and this was the second time we had uh, gone down and visited this particular site where this gr big irrigation pipe in the 1930s, I believe it was, broke, and you had this huge gush of water that came out over this relatively soft landscape, and it quickly cut down this channel, this gully that might be 150 feet deep, 130 feet deep, something like that. And when it did, it revealed this sandwiching of these layers that, that are now called rhythmites. Rhythmites. And they would be formed by back floods. And we talked about that, how the, the stilling waters, once they settle in reverse currents, they'll leave a layer of mud behind. So anyways, Pardee was there at that hit job, at that ambush, and this was the, the first signal of a turning point. Because now what the geological community was able to do is go, oh, well, wait a second. You mean, because, look, by this time, Brett's evidence was indisputable. They've been fighting against this for, for a couple of decades, right? And now the evidence was so overwhelming that, what they did, I think, was out of desperation. They said, oh, okay, well, we know that these outburst floods happen in modern times. We've seen them. We'll just extrapolate up from that and assume that it was a bigger, that it was a bigger version of that. Now we've got our uniformitarian explanation. It just happens over and over, and it's no, not that big of a deal. Of course, when you go out there in these landscapes and you're standing there looking at these features and you're, it, it, you know, you're boggling your mind trying to imagine. But let's go on. This expresses the conventional view. It is now generally agreed that between 15,000 and 12,800 years ago, more than 40 tremendous deluges of almost inconceivable force and dimension swept across large parts of the Columbia River drainage. They were the greatest scientifically documented floods known to have occurred in North America. Notice the date. Notice the mm -hmm. last date, how close that is to the Younger Dryas. How do you get from this date to this date? Well, here's the assumption. Think, let's, let's think this thing through. If each of those rhythmites represents a separate flood, okay, those rhythmites were in those basins where I pointed out that the water couldn't pass through Wallula Gap. So it ponded and, and drowned the basins in the areas adjacent to the gap. And then each time the water flowed out, the, the, the floor where this gully is, is at about 400, 400 feet, I believe. Five, I've looked it up, 400 or 500 feet above the floor of Wallula Gap. So any time the water rose, say, above, and remember I said the water at its peak through Wallula Gap was just over 1,000 feet deep. So any time it was above, say, 500 feet through there, Pasco Basin was submerged. Any time the water fell below that level, the surface, the ground surface would have been exposed. The assumption 
on the part of Richard Waite and his and the people who've come after him was that each of those layers represented a distinct separate flood. And each of those floods was caused by a separate damming. So in other words, if there were 40 tremendous deluges, there were 40 fillings and emptying of Lake Missoula. Therefore, there were 40 ice dams that failed and resealed the valley over and over again. Over a 2,200-year period. Yes. And so that period of time was, well, based upon the modern flow of the Clark Fork River, how long would it take to fill 600 cubic miles? And as I recall in their equations, they didn't take account of evaporation, which, of course, as the lake increases in in subaerial exposure so is the evaporation so i'm not i'm suspicious about the, the length of time that it would take to fill lake missoula to full pool but in either case 50 to 100 years so if you got 40 fillings at 50 years each that's 2000 years now there have been other datings that have put the earliest floods older than 15000 years and I'm suspicious of those dates for a number of reasons, which we won't go into here. But it has to do with the fact of what I think may have been the potential ultimate trigger for the, the great meltdown, if you want to call it that. David Alt, in his book, Glacial Lake Missoula and Its Humongous Floods, which is a book I recommend to people who are going to go on the tours or anybody who wants to learn more. He says, Glacial Lake Missoula was among the largest lakes ever impounded behind an ice dam. Well, yes, <laughs> The ice dam broke when the water behind it got deep enough to float it. Each time that happened, several dozen times, the lake dumped a catastrophic flood on eastern Washington and the Columbia River. Those lakes and floods are among the largest of known geological record. And here's just another graphic to kind of give you the geography of the flood. You've got the ice dam. You've got mm -hmm. the lake. You've got the scab lands. You've got Wallula Gap. You can see that showing here, this was one of the things, the problems I have with the ice dam model, right? So you've got this discharge that looks like it starts right up here, west of the Okanagan Lobe. So you've got to get this water here over to here. To me, it's just a whole lot more straightforward, Brett's original idea, that this, that each of these areas here is discharging right off the ice sheet. 